Hi, this is Dr. Steven Seiler. It's nice to be back. Uh, I really enjoy that live stream event. But as always, there were more great questions than we were able to field at the time. So it just seems appropriate to do a little cleanup and try to answer some of those other really good questions. I've had my ups and my downs. Absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, Let's go. Welcome to episode 325 of the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Polar's stunning new generation running watches, the Polar Pacer and the Polar Pacer Pro. I'm Brad Beer, sports and exercise physiotherapist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. And of course, we do this across a range of our different episodes, interest editions, learning to catch episodes, featured performers, and of course, our ever popular expert editions. And off the back of last week's featured performer episode with Australian cycling legend, three times national road race champ, and dual UCI world championship medalist, Amanda Spratt. Today, you're in for a learning treat with Dr. Stephen Siler sharing some answers from our recent durability and high intensity repeatability live live stream that came through during the Q&A. Now, as you'd expect, when the opportunity arises to ask Dr. Stephen Seiler a question, many hands go up. So with the overflow of questions from the live stream held in April 2022, Dr. Seiler has generously returned to work through those questions. Of course, Dr. Stephen Seiler really doesn't need much of an introduction. He's arguably the most acclaimed sports scientist when it comes to endurance training on the planet, best known for his work around polarized training. And in recent times, his attention has shifted to this concept of durability, which he introduced us to back on episode 317, intensify or extensify the concept of durability. And Dr. Seiler really is a cherished alumni of the show, having featured back for his first appearance on episode 172, then again on episode 219 and 226. So get your pen and paper ready, as always, for some great learnings from Dr. Stephen Seiler with Q&A from the 2022 live stream event, Durability and High Intensity Repeatability in Endurance Training. Oh, and if you'd like to access the full live stream, then it's available on demand for learning over at physicalperformanceshow.com. The live stream is accessible for 49 Australian dollars, which includes a PDF copy of the presentation notes and ongoing access to the learning modules. Oh, and if the audio quality is a little different to our usual production, hang with us. This expert edition was recorded on location here in Tokyo, Japan, ahead of the upcoming World Triathlon Series race in Yokohama. Dr. Stephen Seiler, welcome back for some unanswered questions from April's live stream event, Durability and High Intensity Repeatability in Endurance Training, which was attended once again by people worldwide in the endurance sporting space, coaches, practitioners, and of course, athletes. And as we'd expect, questions were uh, exceeding the available time. So you've graciously offered up your time, your morning there in Norway to, uh, to answer some of these questions. So welcome back and thank you. Yeah, well, thanks. It's raining here, so it's a nice day to be able to sit actually in my home office. And and I tell you, I, I had to struggle with. Uh, you just sent me these questions, and so they're tough. You know, they're, I don't have perfect answers, but I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna do my best. Let's work through them. I was listening back to some of the content that you shared on the live stream and the prior interest peaking episode of the show 317 to extensify or intensify. Uh, we were claiming it as a worldwide first that uh, Extensify had been birthed on that show. The word, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. You know, there's so much in there. And uh, you did say you don't need a PhD in exercise physiology to understand durability. Now, the bulk of these questions relate to this topic. You said we know it when we see it. There are athletes that just deteriorate less than others. It can be trained. It's also a talent. 
And uh, the first step of developing this durability or robustness as an athlete or an individual is the frequency of training. And they were my standout takeaways amongst others uh, from the live stream. Anything you'd add to that quick little uh, rapid fire out of learnings? For me, it's kind of boils down to frequency, duration, intensity, kind of as a pyramid. And, and, and when you're in a flow with your training, you should be able to tolerate the, the frequency that you want to achieve, you know, within your limits, everybody has different goals, but the frequency should be the first thing that is inviolate. Meaning if I'm, if, if I've said, I'm going to train five days a week, then I want to make sure I'm adjusting my training so that I handle five days a week. In a, in a good way. And then I extend, you know, that's the extensify part where I, some of those sessions get longer. I want to use duration to, to, for what it's worth to improve durability, to improve adaptations. And then I sprinkle intensity on top as the icing on the cake. It's important. It makes the cake great, but, but you got to bake the cake first. And, and that's, that's this frequency uh, duration. And then, you know, the, the intensity sessions and that, if you get that basic kind of hierarchy right, a lot of good things happen. Dr. Siler, Jamie asks, what is the lowest tech approach coaches and athletes can take in applying a mon and monitoring a durability approach? Obviously, there's Jamie comments, there's a lot of great tech out there. It's not always accessible to everyone, and there can often be, in some ways, some overwhelming amounts of data. Mm. Anything you'd suggest to Jamie? Well, the absolute lowest tech is still the brain. It, you know, I mean, it's it's the highest tech and the lowest tech at the same time in the sense that great athletes are just really tuned in to their, their bodies and they listen. You know what I'm saying? It's one thing to hear the signals and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually pushing a little hard today. And it's another thing to do something about it and, and pull it back. And so that's number one. The best tool you have is a sensitive dialed in perceptual tool you know it, it can be purely qualitative how do i feel or it can be that you use something like the borg scale during workouts and say you know what when i get into the teens then it's starting to be a little bit too hard on an easy day you know i should be in that 10 11 12 space on the borg scale i should be really there you know and, and i have a tendency to drift up okay do something about that so that's the lowest tech i know now you can sprinkle other little uh low budget tools on top one is that after a long session you should you shouldn't have any appetite suppression most people will not have appetite suppression if they've really been you know in that zone where they're not triggering a big stress response so you should be able to go straight to the dinner table that's low tech as a as a kind of a indicator another indicator would be that you can breathe uh maybe through just your nose or you can talk while you're you know it's it's truly talking pace that's these breathing tests we use they're not perfect in isolation so i'm kind of giving you two or three different low-tech aspects perception breathing appetite after and if all three of those are in the right direction then they will that you're kind of triangulating in on saying okay i was you know i kept below the stress radar and then as you're getting more durable you're able to go longer at a given intensity and still check off those same boxes if that makes sense powerful absolutely uh perception breathing and the appetite uh, as you said prior on this show very high intensity sessions do suppress the appetite and we all know that you don't feel like eating immediately after one of those yet those long sustained uh, endurance sessions extensified sessions they uh, certainly can elicit a big hunger. Yeah, you should you should finish those workouts feeling more empty than than like full of poison. You know what I mean? <laughs> the, the, the high intensity sessions you feel kind of poisoned, right? Whereas the low intensity <laughs> sessions you feel drained. You feel empty. Yeah. Wow. That's that's a nice delineation. Way asks Dr. Silent when carrying out low intensity sessions cycling, how important is it to consider cadence? If wanting to train low intensity durability, are there benefits doing them at a higher cadence? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. It's it's full of folklore in terms of the cycling community as to what they do, and 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 you'll hear different things from different coaches as far as the the evidence base for 
these different perturbations where you go in and try to change cadence. And there's really no clear evidence for any particular superiority or effect. Like, for example, low cadence cycling. Sounds good to me. It makes sense that you might go at low cadence to try to change the duty cycle, recruit some of those bit more fast twitch fibers, and but in a a level where they're not being overstimulated, right? But there's no data to show that that has some specific effect. So I'm just being honest with you. It's kind of this, there's this kind of U-shaped curve on cadence where high cadences are inefficient, low cadences tend to induce to, you know, you're recruiting fast twitch fibers, you get more lactate. So the body tends to self-regulate around some, efficiency it's part efficiency and part um not wanting too high of a of a tension in the muscle right so i'm beating around the bush here but the pro- the, the point of it is is i don't we don't have any specific data to to tell it so if it feels good for you if it feels like you're expanding a bit your your motor skills you're able to handle a higher cadence it eases the pressure on your legs uh and switching a little bit back and forth at different cadences i i think that's probably a good thing because it just makes you more less dependent on any one specific muscle group or muscle set of muscles if you can stretch the cadence a bit uh, and still feel good with it then that's probably going to help you in races fantastic alex asks question for dr silent recommendations for the weekend warrior to somewhat accurately measure their thresholds for each zone without access to a lab, maybe access to running watch data and or Swift, for example. Uh, I know you've answered this prior on on, uh, episodes, but any feedback there for Alex? Yeah, I I know anything I say here is going to get me in trouble with somebody because there is, you know, there is variation uh, individually. I think probably the, the most important threshold to get correct is that first lactate turn point because so many athletes have a tendency recreational athletes have a tendency to to push through that and end up doing a lot of work in that kind of middle zone so lt1 that first threshold one if you're a recreational athlete i would say on the borg scale if you're starting to move into excuse me into the teens you know, then that's a good indicator that you you're you're passing that scale. We've got data on recreational athletes, and when they the LT one they hit at an average of twelve in running, an average of twelve on the Borg scale. The the athletes that were a bit higher, bit more training volume, they were at thirteen. So it was about the same for them, but maybe they were just a, a hair higher on the borg scale in terms of that so that's one you know as an indicator again also cardiac drift helps tell you something if you're clearly below lt1 and you're reasonably well trained then you should have a flat heart rate at least over an hour okay if it's drifting up already in 30 minutes it's too high an intensity it's not you're not in that low intensity zone i I feel pretty confident in saying that that's another indicator now so when it comes to that second threshold, it's maybe I would say, you know, heart rate is definitely, if you're above 90%, you're too high. I mean, you've, you've passed the threshold uh, almost in any athlete we see. So it's somewhere in that, if I'm going to say percentage of heart rate, I would say if you're somewhere 87, 88% is going to be a reasonable guess that that's where we see a lot, a lot, you know, it's in that 86 to 90 range for pe- for heart rate in reasonably well-trained athletes that they're clearly crossing into LT you know, through LT2. So I'm going to be a bit conservative and say, you know, keep it well shy of 90, 80, 86, maybe 87, and then, and then tweak it from there. That's one way to go. Another way to go is just time-based, meaning a steady state effort. Uh, you should be able to do at least 40 minutes, I would say, and ideally maybe an hour, you know, 60 minute hour of power, hour of pace at that kind of, that that right on that threshold that second threshold so that's a time-based way is is if you can only hold it 20 minutes that pace or power it's you're probably a bit too high on you're already past lt2 if that makes sense so that's a time-based method you know just based on lots of physiological testing and maximum lactate steady state tests and so forth where we're just saying if you're on the part of the power duration curve or pace duration curve 
that's in that kind of 40 to, to 60 minute range, it's usually pretty close to that second threshold. You know, again, this is, there's no answer here that's perfect, but those are some guidelines. Yeah, no, that, that's fantastic. Uh, first LT1, first turning point, you mentioned there the Borg scale uh, from 6 to 20. People aren't familiar with that, look that up and you'll see the uh, associated ranges from very, very light to very intense. Heart rate drift can also give an indication for staying uh, below LT1 and then LT2 potentially remaining well shy of 90% of maximum heart rate. And then also think about uh, the time-based uh, side of that as well, uh, knowing that you should be able to hold uh, up to that threshold around for around 60 minutes, the famous Dr. Sila hour of power. <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't create that. So just so I don't, don't blame me, but <laughs> it's been around, it's, it's been around a while. <laughs> I just, I, I, I don't know if some of the uh, smart, the online apps for smart cycling would be as popular if it was a 60 minute uh, FTP test versus yeah, 20 minute one. Yeah, that, that's the thing, you know, <laughs> good old Americans and, and others have a tendency to, we, we have a short attention span. <laughs> so 60 that? minutes. How can we pack this down to 20? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it does it so well. Jim asks Dr. Siler, does Dr. Siler have recommendations about nutrition when doing one or two hours in the green zone? Is it okay to skip nutrition during these training sessions? Obviously, we note that your expertise uh, isn't directly in dietetics, but still interested in your thoughts on this one. Yeah, another way to get me in trouble here, <laughs> put me out over in the nutrition zone. But I, I would basically say one to two hours, I, I would not get too in, worried about nutrition. Don't be stuffing gels in your mouth and all this stuff on these these fairly fairly short, low-intensity workouts. Just drink water, ad lib from a training standpoint and and that may actually be better for, from a signaling standpoint because we really want to promote fat oxidation we we want to we don't want to be presenting the body with lots of glucose during these easy sessions when we don't need it because we're going to stop you know before there's a, any kind of a crisis so i would say to athletes just get used to those you know just like the bread and water actually just water and water on those on those fairly short workouts uh, now the caveat to that is is that as you approach re races you need to train just the process of drinking of of of, of body management and and so that's a different that's a different issue that's a behavioral issue you of not necessarily listening to the signals because they don't come fast enough and, and training your brain to, to drink on a schedule and things like that. So don't get me wrong, drinking and, and all the nutrition is super important on the longer efforts in the race day. But day in, day out, we have a tendency to still do all those things and we don't need it. And maybe it's even negative for adaptation because we're kind of blunting some of the signals we're trying to generate mm -hmm. sure. so my answer water just water on the short workouts that are at low intensity mm. thanks for sharing on that uh intuitively that that seems to make sense as well ben asks and ben did have the uh winning question of the live stream which polar generously donated one of their brand new running watches the polar pacer pro to ben uh for his question but Ben asks, in a multi-sport event and training, do we aim for each discipline to be a polarized split 80-20? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'd probably say no, although I'm not a triathlon specialist. But my reading of the research, and the, we got to think about some different things. One, the transfer of training you know, is one of the things we're interested in. And, and there's pretty good evidence from, from several people all the way dating back 20 years, Mila, way back to 20 years ago, that swimming – is just a beast unto itself. So there's no, there's essentially no transfer of the swimming work to cycling or running capacity, none. Uh, and that kind of makes intuitive sense, to be honest, given that just everything about swimming is so different. There's pretty good transfer between uh, cycling and running. So some of that cycling volume seems to pay off in running. It doesn't hurt and it probably helps a bit. And I think it helps explain why we're seeing some pretty darn good running performances on fairly, fairly modest mileage in triathletes. So that's one aspect of it, the, the training transfer. And then, and then we know that running itself 
is both critical to the overall performance, especially, you know, in, a, in any of these events, but particularly Olympic triathlon distance. So that performance, if anything, needs to be emphasized a bit because you, you got to hang the first two and you win with the run, uh, as we've seen even lately in the Ironman, you know. So, so I would probably push some of my harder sessions towards the run if I'm distributing hard sessions uh, unequally. And I think probably I, I would, and I would overemphasize the run for two reasons. One, because of its importance and two, because the transfer will be good. We know that, you know, running creates a good cardiovascular response and, you know, and, and it, it, it's probably going to have a, a reasonable carryover effect to, to the cycling. So that's my take on it is, yeah, I would not be afraid to shift the high intensities load a little bit, uh, towards running. Uh, but you've got to, you've got to find your balance. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Ben furthers there in comments. What is an in- example of intensity distribution, given that you can only do four by eight minutes so many times in a cycle for it to be beneficial? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So everybody lo- loves to call four by eight, like the Siler interval session or whatever, but it was never intended I never intended to try to say that is the, you know, the interval session. In fact, I'm, I'm very opposed to that kind of idea of there being any one specific magic formula. So I think it's in general, a good idea to, to, to mix it up. Uh, I, I find that four week cycles are plenty, meaning four weeks in a row of a, of a specific session. I think there's some benefit to that because you get a short term. Uh, it kind of sharpens you because you know what you did the previous week and you're in that range and maybe you get a, a few percent bump and, and then you back it down, uh, you know, three week build one week come down and then you say, all right, now I switch, you know, I go to a different workout i'm trying to achieve the same basic stimulus but the, it's the a lot of it's the mental aspect of uh switching it up that is is useful uh and you know you change a little bit the duration intensity relationship also uh just keeping your body on the on its toes a little bit i think is is good mm-hmm. we've played around with with periodization with reverse periodization where you, you might say do i do longer threshold sessions and then periodize upward towards higher intensity. Yeah, that's the traditional model. It works. But the the, the reverse periodization also works, you know. <laughs> so so we haven't been able to show that there's these magical differences in that periodization structure as long as you're getting the the minutes of work, the high intensity minutes. As long as you're getting those minutes, high intensity Maryse asks, can nasal breathing for novice age groupers be taken as an indicator of a change from aerobic to mixed exercise? You've already touched on nasal breathing there earlier uh, as a potential measure. Yeah, it's a... It's a fascinating topic, and I just read a book called Breath by James Nestor. I give him a little free advertisement here because I am interested in the topic, and we're trying to understand breathing more and from a wearable point of view. I have done nasal breathing myself, two-hour sessions you know, on the bike and so forth. I find it to be meditative. <laughs> I find it to be a good kind of approach, but it's trainable, and you get better. And so in my case, I know I can come up over my threshold, my first turn point with nasal breathing now. Now I've got a solid nose, so that may give me an advantage. But in general, the data, the what little data we have on nasal breathing does say that it's it's a to a certain extent trainable, meaning that, you know, so it's not, we can't say it's a a perfect or even a clear indicator of threshold, non-threshold. Having said that, I do think there's a lot of good things about it based on the research. Uh, Mouth breathing is just terrible for us in general, in the daily life, sleeping uh, with mouth breathing leads to a lot of issues, uh, sleep disturbances, apnea and so forth. So I've got a little secret hypothesis that if I do more nose breathing during training, I improve the function of these nasal passages and maybe that helps me sleep better because then i may be in in more nose breathing during sleep which is what i want to be what we all should want to be doing so that's for me an interesting reason to try to do some of my easy sessions 
just breathing through my nose. Fantastic. Now that's, I, I have not published anything on that, but we're thinking, of, we're thinking about it. We're thinking about doing some kind of a study like that. Well, I, I must connect you with Dr. Dan Robinson, who we've featured on the show before, uh, e nose throat uh, specialist who actually operated on my nose to remove an obstruction uh, a year and a half ago. And, uh, and Dan's doing some early science in uh, the space of correcting nasal obstructions and the effect on a uh, on exercise abilities, but uh, watch this space. Dr. Sila Daniel asks, how much high intensity interval training is too much for a 44 year old masters athlete in terms of heart health? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, I've got a, 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 well, it's because it's right up my alley. I've had atrial fibrillation myself, uh, been shocked out of it twice, you know, so I, I have it, I feel it. Uh, I'm good now. And I have a master's student that also has atrial fibrillation. It ended his skiing career, and he's doing a lot of work on this. With a, we've been testing out a a, a, poor, a wearable device that is seems to be really good for for doing EKG in the field. In the scope of all of that, you know, you you study a bit on on what's the etiology, what's causing this, and there it does seem to be an epidemic of 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 uh, electrical kinds of events, you know, um, uh, rhythm disturbances. So what I see from the data is that there's really nothing about intensity, high intensity work that would seem to be a problem for the heart structurally. I mean, you, you don't get torn heart muscle. You don't get, uh, uh things like that. The, the, the muscular aspects, the, the stress on valves and, and tissue, that doesn't seem to be the issue because the pressure changes aren't that big with interval versus not interval. So it, it's, if I were guessing, I would guess that what is happening is more related to autonomic nervous system function. Uh, you know, now I am just way out on thin ice and guessing, uh, but that seems to be the issue is, is that when we get in a state as masters athletes of doing too much intensity, meaning too frequent, probably too frequent intensity, we create some autonomic nervous system stress and the, and the brakes come on and we, we get into some problems there that may be involved in this transition towards uh, a greater risk of, of arrhythmias. So this is speculative for me, but having said all of that, I would just say that, that it seems like a two days a week is enough in terms of, of high intensity load for masters athletes. And, and, you know, in, in general, for a lot of athletes, I mean, two days a week is about what we see with our best skiers and, and, and so forth is, is two days where they're really pushing in 12 out of 12 workouts, maybe three, uh, they might do a double hard session or something like that. But for us, typical masters athletes, I don't think you need to be hitting it hard more than twice a week. Mm. And probably it's difficult to recover if you do. Interesting and, and thought provoking and challenging. Daniel further asks on the other end of the spectrum for his 11 year old son, what's the best me method for calculating zones training for an 11 year old runner? Uh, smiling and grimacing. <laughs> I mean, uh, seriously, small and grimacing. Yeah, it, I would use a two zone model. Uh, they're either kind of bored, but they're, but they're laughing. They're smiling. That's easy. They're in the easy zone, you know, and then <laughs> if you, I mean, kids cannot hide how they're feeling. So their face is going to be contorting. If you're pushing them too hard, if they're hurting, their face gets red, they twist and they turn. And then, so you just use the face zone, you know, and say, all right, this kid's, you know, because remember 11 year old kids don't have much in the way of anaerobic capacity at all. So, so they go, they tend to go from this feels fun to this sucks really quickly in terms of, <laughs> so, so, so I'm saying all this to tell you, man, just let these kids have fun. Mostly let them, you know, just enjoy the, uh, you train the technique and the fitness comes along for the ride at 11 years old. You train just getting out the door, enjoying running, uh, playing with friends, learning how to accelerate, learning how to keep your shoulders down and all these kinds of things. And, and then, and then just in that process, they get some hill training and they get some accelerations and they get some, you know, the, the fitness comes and, and we wait, uh, 
we wait before we start getting all systematic on this stuff and talking about training zones. I, I'm just being honest with you. And your triangle probably has good applications here as well. Frequency, ex- extensification, extent, duration, and the yeah. intensity, right? Even, yeah. even, even just from so looking at that. Intensity is, yeah, we just, we're basically getting these kids used to the, the idea of tr- training. So it's a transition from playing to training. And that, that in itself is, is tough enough at that age, right? So, and, and, and they're getting into a habit. So you're helping them form a habit that they find meaningful. And then that builds the base for a, a transition towards something more systematic in, in maybe four or five years when they're 15, 16. Today's episode is lovingly brought to you by Polar, the world's top choice in personal guidance for fitness, sports, and health. Polar are very excited to announce that they have launched two stunning new generation running watches, the Polar Pacer and the Polar Pacer Pro. Engineered specifically for running, the Polar Pacer and the Polar Pacer Pro are equipped with a variety of functions unique to Polar and provide personalized guidance and support across the entire runner's journey, from the first steps to the marathon and beyond. The Polar Pacer Pro is for those who want to run better. It's one of the most powerful and sophisticated running watches ever built. It's ultra light with a high performance core processor and includes an extensive suite of advanced training tools that will help serious runners improve their running economy and performance. With built-in navigation and running power, it debuts at an incredible $499, whilst the Polar Pacer is for those who want to fall in love with running. It's an ideal running watch for those who are starting their journey as runners. It embodies the simplicity of running with all the essentials, plus the specialized training, sleep, and recovery tools they need to fall in love with the sport. The Polar Pacer will help all runners get started at $299. So if you feel like it's time to beat your best, jump across to Shop Polar at polar.com. Support for today's show also comes from Pogo Physio's online telehealth consultations. If you are a runner or endurance athlete struggling with bone, tendon or joint related concerns, then rest assured our online 45 minute telehealth consultations have been helping endurance athletes worldwide get back to their physical best. You can schedule your appointment with myself or any of the Pogo Physio team by jumping over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash telehealth. For now, let's jump back with Dr. Stephen Seiler on this durability Q&A from our recent live stream event. Dr. Seiler, Elaine asks, when it comes to the low intensity workouts, are they, as some perceive, just fillers or are they actually impactful and making a difference? Well, it's a good question. And what I find is is that we see clear evidence of volume, a, a relationship between both performance and physiological adaptations like VO2 max and training volume up to a significant volume. You know, it doesn't go forever, but, but in runners and cyclists, as they train more, even though the, the percentage of high intensity work is low, their, their VO2 max is increasing. Their thresholds are getting, powers are getting better. So from that perspective, the volume matters. And I think it's been underappreciated by the, the masses or by the studies on, on recreational athletes. That's, that's what we see from the high performers is that they, the, the volume does matter and it does induce adaptation just to train more. Okay. So that's part of this answer is no, these are not trash sessions or, you know, they're just transition sessions. They are fundamental to your process. They are part of that pyramid, frequency, duration, intensity. They're at the base. So if you're not getting enough volume, you're not maximizing your potential for adaptation. I'm just saying it as it is. Uh, Now, having said that, yeah, there are times when 
you're going to get on the bike and only cycle for an hour, hour and a half, which is kind of a maintenance load for you because your typical long sessions are two hours. And it's, I would call those sessions bridge sessions. We're maintaining a signal stream to the muscle to maintain adaptations while at the same time staying below the stress radar because we know that tomorrow is a tough session where we're really going to turn on everything. So I would call that a bridge session. It has a role. It's, it's maintaining signaling, but we're very, we're being cautious because we want to put in, you know, we want to turn on the engines big time the next day. So, so it, we're constantly balancing these things, but, but that sig that signaling is always there and, 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 and it doesn't, it's not unimportant. It's part of our process. You did comment before we threw live uh, talking about the, the recent or the weekend's win at the time of recording of uh, the counterpart Norwegian triathlete Olympic champion Christian Blumenfeld in, the, uh, in his first, or well, uh, any Norwegian's first outing at the uh, World Ironman Triathlon Championships. Uh, he was sick, uh, had some illness and still pulled out the winning uh, performance. Incredible. And, uh, you know, you'd commented, but yeah, there's years of baking that cake for someone like the Olympic champion, Christian Blumenfeld. So clearly these sessions aren't just yeah. filler sessions. Dr. Silas, Stuart asks, uh, rowing coach, Australian based on a rowing coach, 16 to 17 year olds, typically rowing season lasts 18 weeks with the rowers coming in with unfit and also a low technical skill set leading into the main event of the, the season, the head of the river. We have five to six competition races each week. Would a hybrid of the 80, 20 training model work better in this situation? Hope that makes sense. Cheers, Stuart. Well, what I read in that question is, is that in that setting, young athletes, they're not very technically proficient. They're not very controlled. You know, every workout is probably going to edge towards chaos in, in the sense that they, the most likely scenario is that they're working too hard because they're working hard because they're inefficient and, you know, and so forth. And you've got a race each week in that buildup, which means you've got at least one day, the racing day is, is tough, although it's not necessarily a really demanding day, but they do push for some minutes really hard. Uh, and then you're supposed to have some hard workouts in addition. So this ends up being a really tough management issue. So obviously one of the things I would do is just really try to get them to understand the low, the value of being able to row well at low cadence, that it does transfer up and, and that is hard for kids to get. But if they can't row at 18, well, then they can't row at 36. Well, either for sure. So I would discipline was what I was up, you know, and tried to get across uh, when I was coaching young rowers. And then I might think about saying, well, that day that I'm going to kind of waste that race day, which is kind of a little bit of, it's a mix, you know, it's kind of hard, but it's not really a good training day. Uh, I might have these kids after their race, go to the, to the boathouse and get on the ergometer and do some more quality. So to, to, in other words, to really make that day, one of the quality days. And then you only have one other day where you're going to do some interval type work and try to clean up the schedule a bit, if you know what I'm saying, to try to make it very clear that race day is so tough. This is a tough day and we're going to even make it tougher. And then we're going to have one other kind of high intensity day because they want to right? they want to go fast. So it's not hard to get them motivated for those. But the problem is they're going to try to go fast or hard all the time. And then they're going to be a bit stale and, and, and so forth. So that's what I would try to do is clean it up and help them mentally think a little bit more polarized mentally to think, you know, today's the day we get to go fast, you know, bring some excitement around. Them. Yeah. And, and, and then they're holding back. They're holding back. Not, to, not today, guys, not today. You know, tomorrow's our day to tomorrow. We're going to have seat race and tomorrow we're going to kick ass. Uh, so that's the way I was trying. I would, I would try to manipulate the brains of my kids. We even did what we called search for speed workouts, you know, where we, you know, I would tell, all right, close your eyes, you know, and, and just get them into this idea that certain days, were where speed matters other days we were trying to you know it was find zen and find rhythm and so forth and and try to get it in get them kind of geared into that the, the platitudes of dr siler find zen search for speed 
kick ass, the list goes on. Uh, and, 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 and <laughs> Extensify. And finally, uh, Dr. Silent Neil asks two very interesting questions. The first being that Neil comments, there seems to be some debate as to where Zone 2 lies. Alan Cousins suggests that it is the intensity slightly above the first increase in lactate, whereas Inigo San Milan suggests he would aim for the zone between first increase in lactate and maximum fat, ox- maximum fat oxida- oxida- oxidation. Sorry, Your advice seems to suggest mm. aiming for at or below the lactate increase, asking in the context of your average recreational athlete six to 12 hours a week. Yeah, again, boy, this is as, as tough as they get because all of these thing, these terms that were just introduced, you know, they are... Uh, fuzzy even fat max for example is for me a problematic issue because usually we find fat max after you know early after 20 minute warm up and then you do a little protocol so they really haven't been going very long and fat oxidation may continue to increase and you know it may be higher later Uh, we've even seen with runners that we can see in a two-hour run uh that there are their fat oxidation is increasing across that time. And then even, even though that's happening at the end of the two hour run, their lactate is increasing a little bit. And and that seems like two opposed, you know, diametrically opposed things that are happening, but both are going on better fat oxidation. But at the same time, now they're getting fatigued and starting to recruit some of these fast twitch fibers and they get a little bump up in blood lactate. So we need to be really clear on this is it's, it's things are dynamic during these, these longer sessions that are kind of right around that threshold. So having said all of that, my, I, I still use the most uh, physiologically traditional approach, which is, you know, this two threshold, two turn points, LT1, the first little bump in lactate, and then LT2, which is a really clear kind of exponential increase from there. Uh, and the, the area in between is that threshold region of intensity. So for me, Below LT1, that first turn point, that is clearly, uh, you know, at least for those sessions, if I'm below LT1, I'm not triggering that big stress response. And I'm, I'm, and fat max is generally, at least for us, we've seen it's generally in that LT below LT1 region. But, you know, I'm not trying to disparage these other guys, and there's different aspects to how this how this manifests as intensity and duration, you know, interact and, and things get longer. So we've got to keep that in mind. I use three zones physiologically. So zone one below LT1, zone two between LT1 and LT2, zone three above LT2. And then what happens is you can split zone one in that three zone model and it becomes one, two threshold is three. And then you can split the third zone in that physiological model and it becomes zone four five so that's what we do in norway and that's what a lot of others do so these they're both valid they're both anchored around the same um physiology just so we're clear no that's great and the final part of neil's question uh, here is uh in a recent podcast inigo sam milan suggested doing a high intensity rep block at the end of a longer easy workout which is different to your thoughts on determining intensity based on the session rather than time in the zone. What are your thoughts on this, especially for time constrained athletes? And would you consider adding one to two short reps at LT2 or higher at the end of an easy session as being worthwhile or detrimental? Uh, This is going to be one of these, it depends kind of thing. I I get it and I've done it to be honest. I've, you know, I've done a two, three hour ride and then jacked it up at the end for five minutes just to kind of, I, I call it just kind of, you know, get the legs going, you know, <laughs> and, and I, and I, and I, and, and I find that if I do that for a short enough period, just the one push, you know, and, I, and then my heart rate comes back down nicely. 
I don't feel stressed. I, you know, like I've talked about, get off the bike and still feel like I'm ready to go eat and everything. Then I'm saying, okay, I'm going to, I don't mind doing that every once in a while, just to kind of, uh, blow the soot out as we say in the car, you know, just kind of push the gas pedal a little bit and, and, and cyclists, I think will do that before a big race, you know, you'll, uh, or, or, uh, cross country skiers, you know, they'll do a, of an, a very amputated high intensity type of session. This would be even more amputated, just, just a little push. And as long as you don't push that too much, as long as one five minute doesn't become two and then three, see, that's the slippery slope that I would be concerned about mm. because athletes will tend to err in that direction that they will start packing these easy days with they say, well, I'm just going to do some, a couple of sprints. And then I'm going to just do a little 10 minute <laughs> threshold and then I'll probably do a five minute. Well, before you know it, that easy day is really not easy anymore. Okay. So please don't do that. Uh, because ev even from the, the top athletes, they will say that they've all been victims of their own, uh, of that kind of thinking where they get o overreached or start really pushing because they try to squeeze some things into those easy sessions. Yeah. So be careful if you do it. All right. Is it a way of at times though, helping with this high intensity repeatability, like, you know, like you've mentioned, uh, you know, these thousand watt pulse spikes at the end of a long uh, stage race for cyclists. So is it some way of carrying over that, uh, adding a few high intensity efforts at the end of a, uh, of a, yeah, a long training session. you know, but, and, and, and to be honest, what I would do is, is instead of that, uh, I would say make, you know, make us do some of these, I would call them almost Fondo type sessions where you intentionally do a more, uh, unstructured high intensity workout that the intensity is coming in, in different blocks during the two, like a three hour workout, let's say. And let's, you know, so you're going to say my Saturday hard workout is actually a long workout, but during that session, I'm going to have, I'm going to simulate racing and I'm going to put in a climb. I'm going to put in some stochastic, you know, race and chase where I'm having to get on the wheel repeatedly, do some surges and I'm going to recover. And then I'm going to put in another climb at the end with a hard finish. Uh, and, and this is an interval session, but it's more organic. You know, I, I think we get too locked in to saying, well, you know, uh, hard sessions have to be highly structured. No, they don't. Mm -hmm. they, you know, your body doesn't know that you're doing four times eight versus <laughs> six times four. It, your body's not calculating all this. So, so I find it, I, I love doing nowadays myself doing what I call organic interval sessions, you know, where I just, um, it, basically someone call it fart slick when I, or fart lick, but I, it's a, I push it a bit harder than fart lick where I'll just say, all right, warm up. And then I'm going to have blocks of 10 or 15, maybe even 20 minutes where I'm just hitting on the gas repeatedly and, and bridging, trying to bridge and get on the wheel of another cyclist in Zwift or whatever. And, and then as quick as I recover, I do it again. And so I'm, and so then now I don't know exactly how long each of these hard bouts will last huh. because that's what racing is like, you know, in racing, it's not like, well, now I have four minutes hard and then I'll get a two minute recovery. No, you have to respond to whatever's happening in the, in the field, unless you're the lead person. And then you're determining that. Um, so I think these kinds of workouts where you spread some of that hard effort, and then have an hour of pretty easy riding and then hit it again. I think those are great workouts, but they're more organic. Okay. And you have to take them for what they are. They are a hard session and you have to manage them in your training as such, meaning you give yourself recovery after that. Gosh, that's uh, I like that concept organic interval sessions. Yeah. And I gotta be honest. It also, one of the good things about it I find is that you don't get mentally trapped in this watt chase because you know when you with structured intervals athletes psychologically can easily get damaged if they are five watts under their goal mm. right mm. you know i was gonna hold i was gonna do six times four minutes i was gonna hold 360 watts and i only got 350 uh, it was a failure yeah no it wasn't you know <laughs> it wasn't a failure it's just that you have, you, you, you've got some noise around what is your capacity each day and, and so forth. So 
with these more organic sessions, the the you're just going hard, but hard is is what you're good for that day. Mm. And if it is, you know, it, it, so you get less mentally to constrained by very specific watt goals. Now there can be a place for that, but if you're doing that every time you do a hard session that you feel like you've just got to nail the power output exactly, you'll find you'll end up having quite a few sessions where you don't think of them as as successes. And that's unfortunate because it, it creates a, a negative mental kind of spiral. Mm, that, that objectivity of the intensity can be a double edged sword. Hard is what you are good for that day. Powerful. Yeah, and and live with it, accept it, you know, because you got to remember you're you're training 300, 400, 500 times this year, right? They're not everyone going to be a personal record. Gosh, as always, Dr. Siler, so generous with your, your sharings, the accrued wisdom over the years, and uh, the platitudes uh, and the, the maxims that you are uh, espouse are always uh, very memorable and sticky. I've written down quite a few. <laughs> Well, I, d- I just make up words as I go now because I'm so old. That's one of the advantages <laughs> of getting old. You just you just start making up words, <laughs> well, you, like extensify. <laughs> you, I had someone say to me the other day, I was thinking of, uh, they were doing intervals, they didn't want to fly and die. They'd pick that up from one of your prior expert editions. So your, your phrases are out there, <laughs> prol- proliferating the world of endurance sports. Dr. Silent, thanks for stopping by, uh, for, for answering some of those questions, and, um, and obviously for April's live stream event. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show. And I trust and I know, as always, you enjoyed the learnings from Dr. Stephen Seiler. It's probably one that you'll want to listen back to to capture, as always, the great information that Dr. Stephen Seiler shares. You can find Dr. Siler over on Twitter at Stephen Siler, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Siler, all one word. And do check out Stephen's YouTube video gallery. Just search Dr. Stephen Siler for some wonderful learnings via his YouTube. Talking about YouTube, you can find the Physical Performance Show over on YouTube now with complete video episodes and snippets available. Don't forget to keep the podsies coming. That's simply an episode that you're enjoying with a screenshot and tagging in the show at Physical Performance Show over on Instagram. If you have feedback for the show, we are always open to receive it. Easiest way is drop a DM over to myself at Brad underscore beer on Instagram. Massive thanks once again to today's show partners, Polar and Pogo Physios Online Telehealth Consultations. Now, if you'd like to get full access to the live stream event, durability and high intensity repeatability in endurance training that Dr. Stephen Siler presented in April of 2022, jump over to physicalperformanceshow.com. There you can access the learnings on demand. Of course, our show patrons get access to all live stream events, past and upcoming, in return for your generous monthly support. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, it's simple. Jump over to Physical Performance Show, hit the Patreon tab, and there you can pledge your support from just five US dollars per month. Big thanks to the team who make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, Audio Engineering, Susan Wilkin, Show Administration, Matthew Olden, Show Graphic Design, and Milan Borrow for our video assets. Now, coming up on next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, we start a mini-series titled Endurance Innovators. This is where we catch up with innovators in the endurance sporting community, who are making a big difference. Next week, you'll enjoy a conversation with Jeff Byers, CEO and co-founder at Momentus, formerly Amp Human. Following that, you'll enjoy episodes looking at new technologies such as the VO2 Master VO2 Analyzer, worn by some of the planet's hottest endurance athletes. We take a look at the Super Sapiens device and some innovations in the swimming marketplace. So until next week, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show. 